Anne of the Island by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter thirty two. Tea with Mrs. Douglas. On the first Thursday night of Anne's sojourn in Valley Road, Janet asked her to go to prayer meeting. Janet blossomed out like a rose to attend that prayer meeting. She wore a pale blue pansy sprinkled muslin dress with more ruffles than one would ever have supposed economical Janet could be guilty of, and a white leghorn hat with pink roses and three ostrich feathers on it. Anne felt quite amazed. Later on she found out Janet's motive in so arraying herself, a motive as old as Eden. Valley Road prayer meetings seemed to be essentially feminine. There were thirty-two women present, two half-grown boys, and one solitary man beside the minister. Anne found herself studying this man. He was not handsome or young or graceful. He had remarkably long legs, so long that he had to keep them coiled up under his chair to dispose of them, and he was stoop-shouldered. His hands were big, his hair wanted barbering, and his mustache was unkempt. But Anne thought she liked his face. It was kind and honest and tender. There was something else in it, too. Just what Anne found it hard to define. She finally concluded that this man had suffered and been strong, and it had been made manifest in his face. There was a sort of patient, humorous endurance in his expression which indicated that he would go to the stake if need be, but would keep on looking pleasant until he really had to begin squirming. When prayer meeting was over, this man came up to Janet and said, "'May I see you home, Janet?' Janet took his arm, as primly and shyly as if she were no more than sixteen, having her first escort home, Anne told the girls at Patty's place later on. "'Miss Shirley, permit me to introduce Mr. Douglas,' she said stiffly. Mr. Douglas nodded and said, "'I was looking at you in prayer meeting, miss, and thinking what a nice little girl you were.' Such a speech from ninety-nine people out of a hundred would have annoyed Anne bitterly but the way in which Mr. Douglas said it made her feel that she had received a very real and pleasing compliment. She smiled appreciatively at him, and dropped obligingly behind on the moonlit road. So Janet had a beau. Anne was delighted. Janet would make a paragon of a wife, cheery, economical, tolerant, and a very queen of cooks. It would be a flagrant waste on nature's part to keep her a permanent old maid. "'John Douglas asked me to take you up to see his mother,' said Janet the next day. She's bedrid a lot of the time, and never goes out of the house, but she's powerful fond of company, and always wants to see my boarders. Can you go up this evening?" Anne assented, but later in the day Mr. Douglas called on his mother's behalf to invite them up to tea on Saturday evening. "'Oh, why didn't you put on your pretty pansy dress?' asked Anne when they left home. It was a hot day, and poor Janet, between her excitement and her heavy black cashmere dress, looked as if she were being broiled alive. Old Mrs. Douglas would think it terrible frivolous and unsuitable, I'm afraid. John likes that dress, though," she added wistfully. The old Douglas homestead was half a mile from Wayside, cresting a windy hill. The house itself was large and comfortable, old enough to be dignified, and girdled with maple groves and orchards. There were big, trim barns behind it, and everything bespoke prosperity. Whatever the patient endurance in Mr. Douglas's face had meant, it hadn't, so Anne reflected, meant debts and duns. John Douglas met them at the door and took them into the sitting-room, where his mother was enthroned in an armchair. Anne had expected old Mrs. Douglas to be tall and thin, because Mr. Douglas was. Instead, she was a tiny scrap of a woman, with soft pink cheeks, mild blue eyes, and a mouth like a baby's. Dressed in a beautiful, fashionably made black silk dress, with a fluffy white shawl over her shoulders, and her snowy hair surmounted by a dainty lace cap, she might have posed as a grandmother doll. "'How do you do, Janet, dear?' she said sweetly. "'I am so glad to see you again, dear.' She put up her pretty old face to be kissed. "'And this is our new teacher. I am delighted to meet you. My son has been singing your praises until I am half jealous, and I am sure Janet ought to be wholly so.' Poor Janet blushed. Anne said something polite and conventional, and then everybody sat down and made talk. It was hard work, even for Anne, for nobody seemed at ease except old Mrs. Douglas, who certainly did not find any difficulty in talking. She made Janet sit by her, and stroked her hand occasionally. Janet sat and smiled, looking horribly uncomfortable in her hideous dress, and John Douglas sat without smiling. At the tea-table Mrs. Douglas gracefully asked Janet to pour the tea. Janet turned redder than ever, but did it. Anne wrote a description of that meal to Stella. We had cold tongue and chicken and strawberry preserves, lemon pie and tarts and chocolate cake and raisin cookies and pound cake and fruit cake and a few other things, including more pie—caramel pie, I think it was. 
After I had eaten twice as much as was good for me, Mrs. Douglas sighed and said she feared she had nothing to tempt my appetite. "'I'm afraid dear Janet's cooking has spoiled you for any other,' she said sweetly. "'Of course nobody in Valley Road aspires to rival her. Won't you have another piece of pie, Miss Shirley? You haven't eaten anything.' Stella, I had eaten a helping of tongue and one of chicken, three biscuits, a generous allowance of preserves, a piece of pie, a tart, and a square of chocolate cake. After tea, Mrs. Douglas smiled benevolently and told John to take dear Janet out into the garden and get her some roses. "'Miss Shirley will keep me company while you are out, won't you?' she said plaintively. She settled down in her armchair with a sigh. "'I am a very frail old woman, Miss Shirley. For over twenty years I have been a great sufferer. For twenty long, weary years I have been dying by inches. How painful," said Anne, trying to be sympathetic and succeeding only in feeling idiotic. There have been scores of nights when they thought I could never live to see the dawn," went on Mrs. Douglas solemnly. Nobody knows what I have gone through. Nobody can know but myself. Well, it can't last very much longer now. My weary pilgrimage will soon be over, Miss Shirley. It is a great comfort to me that John will have such a good wife to look after him when his mother is gone. A great comfort, Miss Shirley." "'Janet is a lovely woman,' said Anne warmly. "'Lovely! A beautiful character,' assented Mrs. Douglas. "'And a perfect housekeeper, something I never was. My health would not permit it, Miss Shirley. I am indeed thankful that John has made such a wise choice. I hope and believe that he will be happy. He is my only son, Miss Shirley, and his happiness lies very near my heart. "'Of course,' said Anne stupidly. For the first time in her life she was stupid, yet she could not imagine why. She seemed to have absolutely nothing to say to this sweet, smiling, angelic old lady who was patting her hand so kindly. "'Come and see me soon again, dear Janet,' said Mrs. Douglas lovingly when they left. "'You don't come half often enough. But then I suppose John will be bringing you here to stay all the time one of these days.' Anne, happening to glance at John Douglas as his mother spoke, gave a positive start of dismay. He looked as a tortured man might look when his tormentors gave the rack the last turn of possible endurance. She felt sure he must be ill, and hurried poor blushing Janet away. "'Isn't old Mrs. Douglas a sweet woman?' asked Janet as they went down the road. "Hm," answered Anne absently. She was wondering why John Douglas had looked so. "'She's been a terrible sufferer,' said Janet feelingly. "'She takes terrible spells. It keeps John all worried up. He's scared to leave home for fear his mother will take a spell and nobody there but the hired girl. End of chapter 32